Good day chaps. So this video is part of a series that will cover the flamethrowing tanks used by the British in World War II. Look at their background, how they came to be and why, as well as cover some of the more common inaccuracies about them. Fire in warfare is nothing new. The use of controlled fire to burn an enemy is some of the oldest means of waging warfare and for good reason. Its ability to strike a primordial fear that sheer uncontrollable terror of being cooked alive will unhinge even the most professional of soldiers and break their morale. It has been used from ancient times, with pitch to the terrifying Greek fire. The ability to direct an inferno into the enemy has been a viable tactic for longer than almost any other form of warfare, and so it would remain over the centuries. Flamethrowers were used in trench clearing in World War I, from small, man-portable devices to the colossal Livens Large Gallery flame projectors, able to sweep clear whole stretches of no man's land. The first flamethrower tank was arguably an American design, aptly named America, using their 50 ton steam tank, which could mount a flamethrower and was designed for clearing bunkers. But it wasn't until the Second World War that things began to heat up, as it were. With the UK's defeat in France in June 1940, the country began to prepare for the inevitable invasion by Germany. Much of its equipment had been left behind in France, and it began to muster the Home Guard, rebuild its army, and expand its navy and air force. The latter two which would be the primary defence once the invasion began. Bunkers and pillboxes were built, barrage balloons went up, the guns were trained south, and guerrilla commando forces were trained. While we might have been short on tanks, the one thing we had plenty of, particularly with rationing, was fuel, having good supplies in stock from both Iran and the US. Petrol stations near likely invasion points were emptied, and all petrol storage sites were taught how to rig their premises to explode should the enemy seize them. With this in mind, the UK set to a new notion, if the enemy made it past the Air Force and the Navy, they would turn to fire and burn them off the beaches. And so they set up the Petroleum Warfare Department. The man behind this was Minister Morris Hankey, who had been a believer in the use of fire-based weapons in World War I, and believed that the oil reserves should not just be used defensively, but offensively as well, to break the will of the enemy. While the retreat was still taking place in France, Hankey met with the Oil Control Board and Commander-in-Chief of Home Forces, Edmund Ironside, to show him his ideas, and on the 5th of June, Churchill gave the go-ahead to Geoffrey Lloyd, the Secretary for Petroleum, to work with Morris Hankey and form a new department to utilise the nation's oil in an offensive manner. These men would then place Major General Sir Thomas Banks as the Director General of the Petroleum Warfare Department who had run the organisation from 1941 to 1945. The Petroleum Warfare Department would be involved heavily throughout the war, from testing flamethrowers mounted on ships, ambush weapons, and devices such as FIDO, or the Fog Investigation and Dispersal Operation, which could be used to burn away the fog from runways so that returning aircraft could land, and later Pluto, or pipelines under the ocean, supplying fuel under the channel after the Normandy landings but they are probably most famous for their flamethrower vehicles, which this series is about. So we'll look at these, each in turn, and show any footage we have as well. We'll start with the Lagonda and Cockatrice flamethrower. It's worth noting here are two main facts. The first is that all British flamethrowers are, more or less, named after reptiles, both mythical and real, with a few exceptions. These include names such as Salamander, Basilisk, Cockatrice, to adder, cobra, anaconda and crocodile. So much like the ecclesiastical names used for self-propelled guns. Most fire-based vehicles fit this naming category. The second fact is that the vehicle itself does not bear the name. It's the flame unit. So in the case of the cockatrice, the flamethrower mountain projector are the cockatrices, not the machine as a whole. This is the same for the crocodile. The vehicle is technically just a Churchill with a crocodile projector and the name Crocodile does not apply to the vehicle as a whole. But over the years, this has become muddled, and most now refer to the sum of the parts to the Crocodile. There were two key players at this stage. The first was Reginald Fraser, 
who would go on to invent many of the devices, fuels and concepts so essential for the flamethrowing tanks, and was awarded post-war for his contributions. Fraser was the director of the Lagonda Car Company and a fellow of the Imperial College of London, who would work on the fuel and mix and nozzle types within his role at the car company, and would make the first mobile vehicle, called the Lagonda, with a flamethrower mounted on the back. The second person was Lieutenant George John Rackham, an inventor heavily involved with the tanks of World War I, and post-war worked with the Associated Equipment Company, AEC, and designed a heavy pump unit able to expel 750 gallons of liquid a minute. Fraser and Lagonda would develop the first British mobile flamethrowers of World War II, using the Lagonda parts on a chroma truck chassis by Fraser, while AEC would develop the heavy pump unit flamethrower vehicle on a modified Matador truck. The idea behind these vehicles was for the defence of airfields and landing sites from the German Fallschirmjäger paratroopers. It was realised that once deployed, parachuters take around three minutes to gather their supplies and form up to begin their assault once landed, and the best chance to break them was this window of opportunity. Thus the new flamethrowers would be kept at airfields and so forth. Once the German paratroopers began to land, the flamethrowing vehicles would rush out and began to douse them and the landing area in roiling fire. To this extent the flamethrower could fire nearly vertically up, as well as all around the vehicle itself. Only limited numbers of these vehicles were built, however both would come together to form the next vehicle, named the Cockatrice, after the flame projector designed by Fraser. Two distinct versions came about, the light Cockatrice Mark II, based on the Bedford truck chassis, and the Mark IA heavy Cockatrice, which had an armoured body as well as a pair of Vickers K machine guns in the rear section. The Cockatrice flamethrower had a range of about 300 foot and a width of 30 foot with enough fuel for 10 large bursts. The vehicles were intended for the same purpose for airfield defence, although it was also tested on ships which we will cover elsewhere. The vehicle was tested in several locations, notably at Leeds Castle in Kent, where it allegedly caused severe damage to the grounds, and so the vehicles were moved to a new dedicated test site afterwards. The last on this video is the Basilisk, Another mythical fire-breathing reptile. The Basilisk flamethrower was mounted on an AEC armoured car with a large cylindrical fuel tank located transversely in the fighting compartment. A small one-man turret containing the flamethrower was located in the midsection with the gunner sitting in a seat suspended from the turret. A second plan was for a Valentine type turret with a flamethrower also fitted. It was planned that this vehicle would also double up as a fuel resupply vehicle for those running on WD gas oil with three per company of Valentines to double their range, but was not considered economical. None of these vehicles would ever see combat, and only produced in limited numbers, as the design switched over to flamethrowing tanks, which will begin in part two. If you did like this, or want to see more flamethrowers, let us know below, and give us a like, subscribe or share. And until next time, toodle pip.